Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelii Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and your host today. Well, if you live anywhere in the islands and perhaps anywhere in the country, you know that the major public works project here in our state is the building of a fixed rail system all the way through Honolulu on the island of Oahu. It's headed by a group called HART, the Hawaii Area Rapid Transit or Authority for Rapid Transportation. I'm delighted today to have somebody who has some great insights into the project and who can answer questions that are probably on your mind. He's Joe Uno. He's the president of his own company and principal estimator at J. Uno & Associates. He's also a member of the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation, but I want to make it clear at the start that he's not, not here in his capacity as a board member, but as a private citizen. And so anything he says is only attributable to him and his own opinions. Maybe you're asking this question that we all have, what's next for Honolulu's over budget and behind schedule rail project? Joe, well, we're going to ask him what he has in mind. The cost overruns are so vast at this point that redirecting the project may be an option worth looking at. Transparency and accountability are also needed to better evaluate the project's next steps. Joe, so glad for your expertise and your willingness to serve on the board and be with us today. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akina. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, Joe, although you're only a member of the board for perhaps less than a, two years, a year and a half or so, you've had an introduction to the Heart Project from the inception at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your relationship to the project. Yeah, that's an interesting story. So back, uh, I think it was in 2008, um, I testified uh, before the sitting, count, sitting council's uh, transportation committee. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, I'm a cost estimator, a professional cost estimator. I looked at the 600 page uh, cost estimate that was prepared at that point, And I, I was reporting to the council that the estimate at that point was uh, $3.6 billion. And it was far, far below what it should be. It should have been updated to over seven and a half billion at that point back in 2008. Um, I was uh, quickly gaveled off the dais for that comment. <laughs> I was thanked by uh, Chairman uh, Nestor Garcia at that point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uno, and uh, next. <laughs> so that was a real <laughs> well, quick, uh, quick testimony. It might be surprising to some that you've ended up on the board. Now, you, you come to the board with quite a bit of credentialing. Uh, you're, you're in cost estimation in terms of construction, and. I got a question mm -hmm. I want to ask you. Yes, sir. What are we dealing with uh, with the rail? Are we dealing with a transportation project, or ultimately now are we dealing with a construction project? And what kind of background do you bring to that? That's that's really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question because I've come to the conclusion that it's neither a construction project, it's not a transportation project, but it's a political project. Right now, it's all about politics. And when you when you turn it into a political project, it loses any semblance of reason that one might use to uh, as a metric to chart the progress uh, or or make decisions decisions like um, based on cost benefit ratios, uh, decisions that are based on true updated ridership projections uh, and, and the like. So. So yeah, I don't look at it as a transportation project or a construction project anymore. It's all about people's um, political ambitions, I think. Uh, and um, and as such, I think it, it, like I said, it has a completely different metric now. Well, I can see, Joe, why you wanted me to point out clearly that you're not speaking as a member of the board but in your <laughs> own private capacity. You, you know, for, for, for much of the public, there's been this ongoing love-hate relationship with the rail, with mm -hmm. strong pro-rail voices and strong anti-rail voices. How do you account for this high level of conflict in our community? Well, I, I'm not sure I can uh, speak to that very well. Um, I, I do know that it, because there's a lot of money involved and um, the public deserves to know uh, the truth about the rail, about how it's financed, about what our future um, indebtedness is going to be, 
Um, you know, Civil Beat recently did a poll and um, only 18 to 20% of the people th thought that there was transparency and honesty in the, in the city government. And that means 80% do not believe it, that there's transparency. And I think Hart is one of the, probably one of the biggest um, elements to that distrust right now. You know, uh, that's quite a staggering number of people who don't have faith or confidence that we're getting the, the message that the government should be giving us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why ultimately do you think that is? You mentioned earlier politics, but it, it, does it go beyond politics? Does it go into the way institutions are operated? Yeah, I, I, I you know, I can't really, again, I, it's hard for me to speak to that, but I do know that it seems that since I've decided that it was a, it is a political project, that things sort of start to make a little more sense now. Uh, and I'm wondering, well, why, why aren't people talking about this? Why won't they allow us to think about or consider uh, a plan C? Um, you know, why, why aren't we going to get updated uh, ridership, especially, you know, in the face of all of this change that we've been through in the last year, through the pandemic, uh, and and the coming uh, changes, the disruptive changes that are going to come in the in the form of transparency um, and, um, and the the transportation is going to be so disrupted um, in the in the next few years, in the next decade, we probably will have autonomous cars. You and I, I think I've probably bought my last internal combustion engine car. And I may have bought my last car because in the future, we're just going to be able to have ride sharing. And um, that's going to you know, replace a lot of cars and be more efficient and safer for people. Well, I'm glad you're talking about the disruption that technology can bring, which mm -hmm. often leaves in the dust old technologies. So mm -hmm. let me just ask you this question based upon your observation here. Why have we made such an investment in a rather old technology, the rail system, in light of upcoming new technologies like autonomous vehicles? Well, I'm not sure that's a fair assessment because back in when we did decide in uh, to to go th go through with this project, it probably was going to be a good project. I mean, it had ridership projections that were you know done until let's see, uh, 2018. Um, and uh, so it was supposed to be finished uh, three years ago. And those ridership projections, you know, they said that it was going to reduce traffic by 2%. So, you know, people were all in. They thought this was a good idea, reduce traffic, you know, uh, and have that take on, take on the project. Um, but here we are, you know, uh, 2021, and we're, we're not projected to finish for another decade. And that's, that's at, that's if we're fortunate, we will we'll finish in 2031. And you know, we went from you know five billion five billion dollars the beginning to now we're at twelve and a half billion dollars. We have three and a half billion dollars that, that we don't know how we're going to fund. What have you seen as a board member? And again, you're speaking only from your personal private vantage point. What mm -hmm. have you seen <clears throat> challenges for board members? Some have come and gone, and uh, you recently have been added to the board. You replaced John Henry Felix. As a board member, what kind of challenges are being faced? Well, one of the big challenges that, that uh, a lot of people don't know is that we have a quorum challenge. And the quorum challenge stemmed from, we had originally nine voting members and one non-voting member. And then uh, as a result of Act 1, where we got more money, we got the extension of the GET and the TAT from the state legislature, uh, they added four more uh, board members, all non-voting. So that makes a total of 14 board members, nine voting and five non-voting. But the quorum is such that we count all 14 as a quorum. So a majority is seven plus one. So when you only have nine voting members, two members can veto anything. That, that's, 
hard math to kind of wrap your head around sometimes, but uh, it became clear to me that that was a real, really a source of dysfunction for us. Um, you know, two members are, are basically a majority. They, they can veto anything, just two votes. Uh, so we asked the uh, legislature this past session, uh, well, we didn't, you know, we, we asked for some, some relief in terms of, you know, I, we wanted them to clarify how should we count these for, for uh, members? Should all 14 be voting members or should we go back to nine voting members? And, and so a 5-4 five, five, decision would be a majority. Um, and they did not, it didn't make it out of committee. So they sort of left up this, uh, this crazy dysfunction. They just left it on the boards for us. And so going forward, at least until the next, sec next session, and until the city charter can be amended, uh, we have some really, <laughs> we have this dysfunctional um, quorum issue and, and that's, wow. it's a real problem. Well, that's a real management problem, especially in light of the significant decisions that have to be made, sometimes exactly. often very, very critical. Uh, mm -hmm. Joe, we're gonna go to a break in a few minutes, but first uh, I'd like to get your in in initial input on something which is uh, so evident to many people, the rail cro costs have increased dramatically since the initial estimates, and they continue to rise. Right. We've gone from 2.5 billion in 2006 to 12.4 billion today. Everyone expects that to go up also. What's a major reason, uh, before we go to the break, you can give us at least one, what's a ma major reason for the rise in costs? Right. Well, just recently, you know, as I've been on the board, it, it kind of went up by a couple of billion just because I got on the board. <laughs> and I don't want to blame myself for that. But in a way, um, I have uh, challenged the, the staff, the professional staff at heart. And, and, and to their credit, you know, they've, they've uh, come up with, uh, uh, I think, better, more realistic es cost estimates and schedules. Um, we have a wealth of uh, historical data on what things should cost and how long they should take. And that since, and then um, since uh, Lori Kahikina came aboard, uh, there's been a lot more uh, push for, uh, I believe, a more realistic budget and, and uh, schedule projections. So um, I think that's a, a big, has a big part of it. Uh, another part was when we did the P3 uh, process, we were able to gain some information that industry thought that that last four miles was going to cost 2.8 billion. Um, the estimates at that point at heart, internal estimates were 1.4 billion. So right there, we added 1.4 billion dollars to the project because we understood the reality was not 1.4, but was 2.8 billion. So that's uh, uh, one of the big reasons for the, the sort of the sudden increase. But I think, you know, uh, Lori Kahikin is doing a really great job. They're trying to, they want to hold, uh, start to give us better numbers that they can actually meet. Very good. When we come back from a break, I want to ask you about the costs of change orders, which have been plentiful mm -hmm. during the history of the, the rail, as well as unanticipated costs that perhaps should have been. My guest today is Joe Uno. We're going to be right back talking about the rail. I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelee Akina talking with Joe Uno, a member of the Heart Board for the Honolulu Rapid Transit. He is here in his private capacity and answering some important questions. Joe, uh, the CEO, Lori Kahikina, says the project will cost $12.4 billion and take another 10 years to finish. Uh, that's about $3 <laughs> billion dollars more than existing sources of revenue, including surcharges, borrowing, and federal funds. Right. Uh, now that the costs have risen so fast, and with the news that we're about $3 billion short, what are the options that HART has for funding and for completing the project? Yeah, we're, we're in a real pickle here. Um, you know, uh, I think some people, we might be, praying that we'll get some of uh, uh, President Biden's infrastructure money, but um, there have been uh, op opposing opinions on, on the viability of that idea. I think um, usually, typically in a project like this, you would float some bonds and uh, be able to finance this, the rest of the project. Uh, right now, without an extension on the GE and the TAT, uh, which was didn't make it out of committee again this year. Um, there's uh, there's no way to pay for uh, another bond issue, in my mind, in my estimation. That right now are the GET and the TAT end in 2030, and for us to get more uh, to be able to float more bonds, we'd have to have a uh, Basically, an indefinite um, uh, extension on that on that G G E and T A T tax, and uh, we don't have that right now. And then another issue that's um, that's facing heart relative to uh, borrowing more money is that the city has a limit on the amount of debt that it can take, and I believe it's something like twenty percent of the budget. Um, and we've already, you know, gone to the well once, and they've extended that or increased that amount of debt just for Hart. And you know, um, not too long ago, um, the Truth in Accounting um, nonprofit right. put out a report that you know Honolulu was the third worst financial shape in the country, and um, that at that time that did not include Hart. That number didn't include heart and didn't include a three and a half billion dollar additional uh, for, uh, uh, shortfall. And I don't think it it completely uh, included all of the um, unfunded liabilities. And those uh, those, as you know, Dr. Kina, those are those, those bankrupt other cities that don't have a heart. Well, we certainly have a challenge ahead of us if we continue with rail as originally conceived, uh, you have come up with an, a different way of looking at rail. We call it Plan C. You've written mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. recently. Could you briefly describe what you have in mind in terms of Plan C and uh, talk a little bit about ridership? Yeah, so I, I put forward in, in, in a letter to the editor uh, two months ago, uh, Plan C. And, and what, I, what I'm seeing is that we're, we're at a real uh, opportune time, a real inflection point on the project. The, the current contracts end at Middle Street. The current construction contracts end at Middle Street. We don't have any design or construction contracts um, beyond that, east of Middle Street at, the, at this point. Um, you know, we have, like we've talked about, we have this funding issue. Uh, we, have, we have what I believe are, are really really outdated uh, ridership projections. And even those ridership projections for 2018, uh, some would say uh, were, uh, were absurdly inflated. Um, and uh, so we have some real challenges with respect to um, with the, the ridership. The other thing that I think I mentioned earlier was the uh, the rise and the opportunity of autonomous vehicles and a disruptive technology that that will bring. Um, that's something uh, that's that we're on the cusp of the future here on on that type of uh, technology. Um, 
I think ride hailing and sharing are going to really change things a lot for us. And I think that, you know, this is a real opportunity. We, if we at heart should take the position that we are trying to build a multimodal public mass transit system, and let that sink in a little, a multimodal mass transit system includes buses, includes autonomous vehicles, includes the, includes the rail up until Middle Street perhaps. Um, I think it's a real opportunity uh, for us to, to take a pause. There's a, right now there's already a transit station at Middle Street. Um, there may be opportunities there at uh, Lagoon Drive also. Uh, that's a, a nice opportune place to uh, get on the freeway uh, and uh, go down Nimitz from Lagoon Drive. Um, so I think, like I said, I think we're at a real inflection point on the project and it's a perfect storm. Things have just come together. You know, the pandemic, uh, the slowdown in the money, the, in the riderships, those are all coming together at the same time. And it's like that joke about, you know, uh, God not sending a helicopter, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I mean, it's exciting to hear you talk about that. I've got my iPhone in my hand here. And just to imagine that the solution may begin here and I may be taking three or four different modes of transportation to get me to my destination and back, but in mm -hmm. a way that's very efficient. That's very forward thinking. And it, mm -hmm. it really is the direction we are going. Uh, yeah. There are some other funding issues that you've raised, particularly with the federal funding. There's a lot of confusion as to whether we'll lose federal funding should we not complete the rail project all the way to Ala Moana. And we have the full funding grant agreement. Do you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, so the full funding grant agreement, uh, we, the city in, uh, of Honolulu agreed with the, the Federal Transportation Authority that um, the complete system would go all the way to Ala Moana. And uh, for that, the uh, the grant agreement was $1.55 billion. Uh, the feds have paid us $850 million, I believe, so far, or I'm sorry, $800 million. Right. And um, uh, there's $755 million that is still to come. So right now, I, I I characterize it as the boogeyman because people trot that out and say that if we don't go all the way to Alamana, we're going to have to pay pay back the eight hundred million dollars and lose lose the seven hundred fifty five. And so, well, if you do the math and if you said stop at Middle Street and you had to pay back the eight hundred million dollars, wouldn't that be a better solution than going into debt another three and a half billion dollars? I mean, that's over four times the loss, right? So it's it's sort of in that that vein of people have this aversion, loss, what they call loss aversion, and uh, they just don't want to give up that money. But the actual truth of the matter is, I believe, and I don't have, you know, I don't have this from the federal government at all, but I believe that the federal government they also want to see a multimodal mass transit system for Hawaii and Hon for Honolulu in particular. And I think that, that they would be willing to work with us. Um, I don't think that they're gonna sue us and, and get all the money back. Uh, so I think, again, like I said, I characterize that as the boogeyman that gets that trotted out all the time. Uh, to scare people into thinking that you know we have to go all the way to Ala Moana or 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 else, um, you know the math just doesn't work out very well. Well, Joe, you've been very informative today, and uh, as we close, I'd like you to put on your look at your crystal ball. Tell us what do you see next for the rail? What do you predict will happen, and how <clears throat> do citizens respond and communicate to their leaders? Yeah. Well. Doctor, um, you know, the, the recent passing of uh, our master navigator, Chad Babayan, um, really brought to the fore um, 
what he and Hokulea and the Polynesian Voyaging Society have brought to Hawaii. And I know I'm going out a little bit on a limb here, but but they really brought in, you know, an understanding of 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 what is Pono. And I think that I think our leadership really needs to consider how we're going to live Pono. How do we make decisions based on not just our our short term gains of you know um, of getting elected on the next round? Uh, who who's going to be governor next, or or who's going to be mayor next, or whatever? Those are short term gains and. Um, you know, if you follow Simon Sinek and his infinite game theory, um, you want to think longer term and not just short term. And I think that's I think that's a key for our leadership. Uh, with eighty percent not trusting the government, I think people should take a. I think the government, our, our elected leaders, should take a real lesson from that. Um, I think we owe it to our people, we owe it to our children and our grandchildren to do the right thing, to decide in a Hono manner what is right for, for Honolulu. Um, and um, because it's a political project now, that people need to speak up. They need to call their city council people, they need to call their representatives, they need to write letters, they need to write emails to them and let them know how they're feeling. If 80% of the people are unhappy with the way things are going, that's a big voice. And it's not a silent majority. You know, it shouldn't be a silent majority. And if you want to see change happen, you have to make your voice heard. Well, Joe, I want to thank you for that mana'o. We appreciate all you've shared today, and we'll look forward to learning more from you in the future. My guest today has been Joe Uno. We've been talking about the rail. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelii Akina from the Grassroot Institute. Until next time, aloha and ehana kako. Let's continue to work together. <laughs>